Blog Talk Radio. What's up, everybody out there, and welcome to another edition of Cover 2 with Millen and Purdue, the show where we talk nothing but NFL football. This is the pinnacle of it all. It's time. It's on. I'm one of your hosts. I'm Devin McMillan. I'm here at the roundtable with my partner. we got Freddie Purdue in the building. What up, Fred? What's going on, man? Uh, a whole A whole NFL season comes down to this. It all comes down to this. All right, man, we're here, Super Bowl 53. And if you've been living under a rock or you just want us to reintroduce things a little bit, we're going to be in Atlanta this weekend. It's going to be the Los Angeles Rams versus Fred's New England Patriots. Uh, Once again, the Patriots are hosting the the New England Patriot Invitational. And like I said, it will go down (laughs) in Atlanta. Man, before we get started, I just got to ask you about the irony of this. Ray Lewis is throwing a Super Bowl party in Atlanta. Don't do it, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> Man, oh, you know, don't do it, Ray. I gotta, yeah, Ray, Ray, just from one high school alum to another, man. What are you doing? <laughs> Stay away from yeah, Atlanta. I, I, I think Ray trying to get his do over. You know, let you know we can do this. We can We can party in Super Bowl weekend in Atlanta without. Somebody getting poked up. I don't know what he's trying to do, but don't do it, Ray. Yeah, <laughs> Somebody going to try to take you back. Yeah. Somebody going to try to take you back there. Don't do it, Ray. Yeah. All right, man. Yeah. <laughs> so it's on. You've had, you know, a good week and a half to to exhale, uh, take in, you know, what's happened in the in the championship game and in the entire season. Um Man, you're here again, once again, as an analyst and a fan. Oh, lucky you. <laughs> but let's talk about it, man. Let, let's, let's do this. Let's start off um, by talking about uh, what each, like, each team's path to get here. Like, what happened this season? What did they overcome? What were some of the storylines behind both of these teams? Let's start out like that before we get into the actual game where we look at Offense, defense, special teams, and um, with each team, you know, keys to victory and things like that. And, of course, at the end of the show, the last thing we'll do is make our Super Bowl picks uh, winner and score. So, thinking back to the beginning of the season, even prior to that, you know, if that fits the narrative, if it fits the story, like what were some of the main storylines behind these two teams that you can think of that you want to talk about. Easy, one of the easiest the easiest things for me was you know preseason everyone expected these this at least this team this Patriots team to be here. I was a little bit on the skeptical side. I mean I, the schedule wasn't too daunting, but the pieces that you know teams lose you lose a Brandon Cooks that's not always good. You're losing you lose a Deion Lewis. Oh. Yeah, I mean, you you know how the Patriots do that. It's not it's not rebuild, it's reload, and but it always takes a little bit. And you know how that narrative is. Uh oh, Patriots dynasty is going down. Can't believe it. They lose a game. They're inconsistent. Something's going on. I mean, I mean, these guys won three out of four in the preseason. I don't pay attention to preseason much because it, I mean, Brady doesn't even play. So. But when you lose, you lose a game to the Jacksonville Jaguars. They just completely obliterated that defense. I mean, you lose your defensive coordinator to the Lions as a head coach. That's a problem. I mean, they couldn't stop the run. Certain games they couldn't stop the pass. You lost to the Lions and the Jags back to back. Ironically, the Jags did. They had that was their best win of the year, and it never nothing else was good from there. Uh, then you turn around and you you play that. You know, as this whole thing is unfolding, out in Kansas City, you have Pat Mahomes just killing it. And you're like, 
Uh oh, they're on the schedule. Uh oh, that dragon gets slayed. But then you turn around, and every game seems like there's always. I could point to games like the Bears game, the lot, the Bills game, the first time around, where the offense just didn't look like it was clicking. The offensive line didn't look all that great. The defense just seemed just below average. Um, I could even point – I point to the Tennessee loss. I'm like, this team isn't all that great. And you heard me say that throughout the year. I said, man, I'm not really sure about this team. Even – and, you know, when I'm a little bit more objective than the, the typical fan, I want to – I look at my team, you know, through the lens of – I try to look at it through the lens of what Bill Belichick sees or what Tom Brady sees. And what I saw was a team that just didn't – they were forming, but right now they're just a project. Things, guys were injured, and that was a big part of it. Um, you knock off teams like uh, Green Bay. You knock off the the, uh, the the Vikings. Those teams were – preseason, you think, oh, these teams are going to be in the playoffs. Good test during the regular season. But no one game really stood out to me where, you know, the Patriots looked dominant. You know, year every year you say – okay, they lost to a team, the dynasty's over, and then there's a game after that where they just blow the doors off of a team. That didn't really happen this year. And I think that's what scared me a lot about this team. Um, lost to Pittsburgh, lost to the Miami Dolphins on that Miami miracle, whatever that was. Um, I, can, I, can, I can be okay with the Dolphin loss. It, it, those kind of, kind of things happen. The Steelers' loss really made me worry going into the playoffs because – the Steelers, they picked us apart. I'm, I'm just going to call it what it is. They picked us apart. They confused Brady. They got pressure on Brady. And that that was the beginning of the MCL stuff. And it, it just really was one of those things where I'm like, this team might make it out of the second round of the playoffs, but if we have to play that, that monster out of KC, I don't know. So their path hasn't been an easy one. But they seem to morph their morph offensively and defensively to me, and I think that's the greatness of a coach like Bill Belichick, where he he knows how to change his game plan to fit what his opponent's doing, not uh, just like any other team that we're just going to do what we do week in and week out and hope a team can stop it. Yeah, well, pretty much um, like you said from the. The start of things, you know, a lot of people out there thought that this Patriots team would be right back here this year. Um, there were some doubters because there's always uh, the age factor um, when they talk about Tom mm-hmm. Brady figuring at some point he has to fall off a cliff. And because in some areas statistically, you know, he was a little subpar in comparison to his legendary self, you know, people thought that they were getting that at some point. I mean, um, probably an ironic fact, Tom Brady was the worst-rated quarterback this season versus the Blitz. So you look at that, and you, and you have no other answers for it besides the fact that he's old. But at the same time, older veterans usually eat Blitzes alive. So you look at that, and you're like, okay, that's not Tom Brady. We have to find some reason for there to be, and there's no other reason mm-hmm. with anything going on with Tom Brady we can say or that we can point to besides he's old because other than that he's still killing it at his particular age um so i think some people may have even wanted him to fall off that cliff so you know like we've seen in the past three seasons tom brady makes one mistake and and and, you know the haters are out there ready to throw him into the microwave yeah um but but here we are in a big situation in a shootout with the youngest um most polished, <laughs> uh, biggest gun in the league, you know, he still comes out victorious and is playing in his ninth Super Bowl. So, you know, I, at some point, Father Time is going to kick in and take over. But I think Tom Brady might be smart enough to know, you know, when that's about to happen. And he might step down before we ever get to see Tom Brady looking like a scrub. You know what I'm saying? So, right. yeah, it, it's always they're always in the mix, and it's and it's amazing. It's kind of like the Spurs in basketball, but it's even, you know, it's even more like the Spurs. 
they've had their their kind of run. They got five championships out of it, and you see people leave and you see people get old. And at some point, it's not even like we say with the Patriots, like okay, they're not going to get back to the Super Bowl with the Spurs. They're like okay, they're not going to get to the playoffs. So just getting into the playoffs for the Spurs, you're like, how the hell do they keep doing this? But the Patriots, <laughs> yeah, are not. You know what I'm saying? When we think that things might be falling apart, oh, Brady and Belichick had some public beef last year. Oh, Belichick got rid of the backup. You know, Brady won a power struggle. Uh-oh, Brady's 86 years old. But they keep finding themselves in this game in the first weekend of February. So, man, kudos, hats off to that team. Um I think a lot of fans out there spend way too much time just basically having disdain for greatness. And they don't realize it's probably best to appreciate the type of things that you see in this and a whole lot of other sports because a lot of this type of greatness, you'll you'll either never see it again or you're going to miss it when it's gone. Like, we all have jokes. You know, we're going to get in on the the Patriot jokes and all of that. But I have – the utmost respect for this team, for this franchise, and what they've been able to do. Like, people sound silly right now when you're still trying to throw out reasons of why they're – not reasons, but excuses to why they're still so good. And most of those excuses, you know, center around cheap or something like that. I'm like, you sound silly. That's what I always tell you, Fred. I'm like, stop talking the bait. Like, people are going to keep talking. People are going to say stuff about the Patriots. People are going to say stuff about Brady. You, you, they say, uh, success breeds contempt. <laughs> those are the those are the three words that you need to type every time somebody says something. Success breeds contempt, and just leave it at that. But um, so they're they're back here, back in the big show. Um, the Rams, on the other hand, now this was a team. I think, okay, they were they were a pretty good team last year. They were in the mix. Um, the the four teams that everyone spoke about in the National Football Conference last season, of course, Philly, um, uh, the Rams, the Vikings, and the Saints. Mm -hmm. So the Rams, looking at the natural order of things in sports, um, we figure that they were one of the teams who had a shot to be next up. They went out in the free agency period and made for damn sure that they were going to be the team that was next up. And even throughout that all, and I believe they ran off, what did they run off? Like uh, six, seven, eight, nine, like maybe eight games in a row to start the season? Yeah, eight games in a row, eight and oh. Yeah, I think they were eight and, and it wasn't against the season. scrubs either. They weren't, right, yeah, right, eight right. and they weren't scrubs. I mean, you, you're talking in, in Minnesota. That end game run, eight game run, yeah. You you threw in the Chargers, the Vikings, Seahawks, um, the Broncos with the defense that they still had. They actually, the Broncos, in my opinion, were actually the first team to really, really test agreed, Patrick agreed. Mahomes. Um, you know, on that on that Chiefs team. So the Broncos defense was still doing their thing. Um, the Rams only ended up beating them by three. So you know they gave work to to. The Rams they gave work to the to the Chiefs. Um, then you had you know the 49ers in that that mix. They were supposed to be a better team. Uh, Green Bay. They were until we realized Garoppolo wasn't going to be there for the 99 percent of the season. I kind of throw an asterisk right. on that one because uh, you know we don't know what that team is yet until they've had moments. I want to see Garoppolo there. So I, can we put an asterisk on that one until next year? Hold that off till next year. Yes. Yeah, stay healthy because we can't keep doing this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Next year, if he gets hurt, then he's he's brittle. But I, I really, I've been wanting to say that all year. Can we give him a give him that, that team a pass? Give that team a pass. So of course, um, you know the the winning streak can, ended against the New Orleans Saints, who the Rams ironically got their uh, revenge against last weekend Tough when it really twice counted. In a year. Right, whether you do like it. Um, how it ended, um, they went back there and they did what they had to do. Now, that's the that's the point I was trying to make. Because even though this team made the additions that they made 
in the off season. You talked about Cooks leaving. Um, you know, Cooks ended up on this Rams team. Um, uh, and Dominican Sue joined Aaron Donald on that line. Uh, you had the two corners back there, Talib and Marcus Peters. Um, you just Add put in. together Damn a shield. really good yeah. roster of names. Uh, we spoke all year, though, Fred, about, okay, they're great as far as the roster, as far as the names go, the, the, at least. Because they had to pay all of these guys, it kind of messed with their depth. So this team was kind of walking on eggshells all year because a few major injuries could have derailed everything we that they it. were trying to do. Right, we and, we, and we did. Went down. Um, but after that same game. Or not game, Peters, I'm sorry, uh, Keith Tlaib, yeah. Keith Tlaib, sorry. Uh, Tlaib, yeah, yeah. So, but after that Saints game, you know, even though this team was doing so well, and even after the Saints game, they beat the Seahawks for the second time, even beat the, the Chiefs and what might have been the greatest regular season game that we've seen in I don't know how long. A long um, time. That was a good one. That was an all-timer. <laughs> so even though they were still playing at that level, the Saints became the team to beat. But you know the ebbs and flow of the season, and you know Dallas did what they did to the Saints, and then people started on the Saints a little bit. I think the Saints got their 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 mojo back, and I think the people started to believe again. And, and Chicago the Rams kind of inserted themselves a little bit towards the end Chicago of the year too, especially after beating those Rams. Because you look at the four we talked about in that conference last season, I think only two of those teams remain, and that's the Rams and the Saints, because this season. The, you know, the teams to beat Rams, Saints, Bears, and who would who would even be the fourth? Is there a fourth <laughs> that, no, that even deserves no. to be up there? No, I mean, I there's not. There's... lost to the Eagles in the wild card round, but truth be told, the defending champs, you know, the way they were playing during the season, their names weren't being mentioned. They people Most people thought they weren't going to be in the playoffs. Maybe yeah. we'd have to throw the Cowboys in there. Um as, as I'm not ready fourth. to do that. We're not a strong. I'm not ready to do that. Not a strong. Yeah. A They're fourth that went on one throughout the season. You know, there was still a lot of we don't believe peoples in there because they're the Cowboys. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. So now here we are, the Rams, right in the mix, right where a lot of people, including myself, they would be. Um, I actually picked them in the preseason too to the Super Bowl and to win the Super Bowl, but what I didn't expect was for them to be playing in the New England Patriots. So that makes my decision a little bit more difficult as we go into... I was, a little, I was you know, slightly ahead of you on that one. Slightly. Yeah. Slightly. I picked this game too, but, you know, stretch. yeah, yeah. So, it's been a, you know, you put it like this, you know, because a lot of people will hold it against all you were supposed to be here. The Patriots were supposed to be here. But how much pressure is that when you come into a season and people expect you to be there and then you go through all the obstacles and all the highs and lows of a season and you end up there Mm -hmm. again? I mean, well, there for the Rams, but for the Patriots, there again. Like, what kind of pressure is that every single season to go out and be expected to be in this point? And most seasons, get there. It's crazy. So I love the match. It's very right tough. Now, I love the It's matchup. very tough. And, you know, from my, my experience is, my experience is, you know, I'm on both sides of this thing. I see it from the college side, and then I see it from the NFL side. Seeing the NFL side, I understand what, you know, Alabama fans go through, and sometimes they mm-hmm. get on my nerves. But I, get, I see what they go through because they're expecting their team to be there in that playoff situation at the end. And anything less is like a very big disappointment. But at the same time, it is, you know, you hear, you hear so much chirping from everybody, especially you get one loss. And for them, it's a little bit different because one loss can end your season. One loss for a Patriots team, okay, you lost one game. So, you know, five, five games is like the threshold that you don't want to go past that. Then they start getting really murky, and you don't want to really catch that because – you know, the NFL playoff system, you know, with tiebreakers and all this other stuff, you don't want to test that. But, you know, seeing that is it's a tough road. It really is a tough road. Yeah. No doubt. So let's let's get into um the the units 
particular units of each of these teams. Um, let's start with each team's offense. Like, what do you see from these teams, you know, offensively that basically got them to this point and will give them an opportunity in this game? You know, when I look at – we can start with the Rams here. Um, Jared Goff, for the last two years we've said – you know, actually, we can go back a little bit further. His rookie year with Jeff Fisher, who uh, he should be banned from the NFL. He should never get to touch another another team ever again because the night and day that we've seen in the last two years from that first from his uh, Jerry Goss rookie year is just it's crazy. So over the last two years, we said Jared Goff can throw the football. He can throw on for different platforms. We've said he has a pretty good arm. He reads defenses pretty well. Um, but he needs a few weapons around him to make him look a lot better than what he is. So what do you do? You give him Todd Gurley. You give him Brandon Cooks. Now you have a deep threat to go with that pass, that dual threat running back. I, I, I use that term for certain positions, a guy that can catch it and he can run it. Um, you give him – you have uh, Robert Woods, who's uh, – he's, he's the quintessential uh, possession receiver. You just want him to get first down. Uh, you you lose Cooper Cup, which I thought that was going to be the Achilles heel of this offense because you always had the deep threat. You always had the guy in between, but who's going to go over the middle and take those hits and, you know, get the cheap yardage? You know, a la Julian Edelman, a la Kevin Hogan, those guys we'll get to in a little bit. You know, but this offensive line has been a lot better than I thought it was going to be. Those guys are great. They're flashy. It's cool to see all the highlight plays. But when I look at this team, I look at the offensive line, and I think to myself, right. Andrew Whitworth, who's he's, he's, he's like 85 years old now, and he's still just dominant. You know, dear Bengals, you messed up. Um, he, had a few, he had a few years in the tank still. Um, but it all comes together when you see with, with Sean McVay. He's such a creative mind. And we've seen, we saw it with uh, the Washington team when he was there, but we really see it now, the bubble screen game, the, the jet sweep game. You know, you put, two, you put a guy like a Brandon Cooks in the backfield, motion him out, and you do different things with, with different pieces. At this level, the NFL is chess, not checkers. And how you make your players, how you kind of move these guys around is – one of the it's a it's an art form. I tell anybody if you've ever really studied a game, you know it's it's an art form. Um, Todd Gurley's banged up in this one. He has a knee injury, so I'm wondering how that's going to affect things. CJ Anderson is just a meat and potatoes kind of running back. He's he's going to get you three yards in a cloud of dust. He might break one for ten, eleven yards every now and then, but he's not dynamic really. Um, they have a tight end, Tyler Higby, who's really an underrated tight end. No one really knows who he is yet. Um, I don't want him. I don't want, to, want anyone to find out who he is in this game. But he's very dynamic over the middle. He can block pretty well. Um, but this team, they're, they're loaded offensively. Even if, even if you go down to guys like Josh Reynolds, who coming out of Texas A and M, I thought was a body catcher and still kind of is, but. He, when he needs to make a catch, he just seems to always be there. So when I look at this offense, they, this offense can score points in various ways. They don't, they don't have to just – they don't need only the long ball. They can, they can dunk their way down the field. They can, they can Todd Gurley you up and down the field, of essentially, uh, inside or outside, even though Todd Gurley seems to be one of those guys. He's like 6'1", like 225, and yet he runs like he's – Five eight, hundred and ninety five 195 pounds because he always wants to get outside and he always wants to avoid the contact all the time. And that's one of the most th- one of the things that infuriates me about him, you know, as a running back. But when you have Todd Gurley, it's a matchup nightmare because you can't put a uh, – in terms of this game, you can't really put Dante Hightower on him too slow. You can't really put Devin McCourty on him. He's too small. So who do you do? If you put him in space, he's just going to break somebody's ankles or run them over. And that's where the problems begin. Every player on their team is a matchup nightmare. And Jared Goff has a ton of weapons to do what he needs to do. 
Right. And Jared Goff has absolutely turned a corner. Um, I like to remind people um, of the Fisher effect because two years ago when he was a rookie, a lot of people were quickly calling him a bust, but they weren't basically, you know, they I weren't paying well. attention. They weren't I giving the, yeah, they weren't giving the credit to the fact that pretty much everybody looks like a damn bust under uh, Jeff Fisher. Um, shout out to Nick Foles. Um, <laughs> Uh, shout out to <laughs> Kate Keenum. I mean, not that he's great, but shout everybody's out to greater uh, than what they showed Jake you. Jake Locker. Jeff Fisher. Right. So so I'm sitting here thinking, like, damn, how good was Steve McNair? Because <laughs> he's like the only quarterback <laughs> in the last five years. Had <laughs> decent under this guy, even to a tune of an MVP award. Um, yeah, so uh, a great season for Mr. Jarrett. Of course, with the record of the team, 13-3, uh, 64.9 completion percentage, 4,688 yards, um, 8.4 yards per attempt, 32 touchdowns, 12 interceptions. That's a, that's a very good season. I mean, and you look at, like you said, all the weapons that he has around him and the way that he's been able to utilize them, you know, you can clearly see why he's one of the quarterbacks that's, you know, staring at the Vince Lombardi trophy this week. Um, I know a lot of people, especially people from Philly, they are like, oh, man, I want Jared Goff to win one um, because he'll win one before Carson Wentz. And I'm like, look, man, Carson Wentz has one. You know what I'm saying? He wasn't in that particular game, but I think people kind of dismiss and Without him. On to get to that point. And if Carson Wentz and his offense and the Philadelphia Eagles as a whole weren't playing the way they were playing up until that Rams game last year, the Eagles wouldn't have sniffed uh, Minneapolis last season. So, you know, I don't want to hear that he's going to get one before Carson if he wins. Um, everything in sports isn't a one game. You know what I'm saying? It's it's a very big game, and you get judged on how you play in it. But we're not taking anything away from Carson Wentz. But either way, man. It's good to see the new blood in the league being this successful anyway. You know, for a long time, we would say, uh, yeah, yo, these early, these first-round quarterbacks, man, they're just not living up to the billing. They're not like the classes of old. Now you have some guys you know, coming in and doing really well. I mean, you had three of these quarterbacks in the playoffs this season um, from that from that draft. Um, and I might be slighting somebody else. I'm trying to think who else was in there. I know it was Jared Goff, Carson Wentz, Dak Prescott, um, all three playoff teams this year. So um, I think Jared Goff is good. I think he's definitely good enough to lead his team to a win in this game. We'll talk about the keys and how that can go in a few minutes. But let's flip it over to the other side and talk a little bit about your Patriots and their offense. Um Another unit where people might just dismiss some of the names on it, but then when they get going, this is just not the team that you want to shoot it out with. <laughs> and, and it's amazing to me how, you know, that always becomes the situation. It's like no matter what they're going against, you know, this team can step up and always get yardage, move the sticks, get touchdowns, get figure. whenever they need something, they're able to get it, but nobody respects the talent on this offense outside of a few guys. So uh, what's, what are your thoughts on the Patriots offense, how they got here, and what they can do to scare the Rams on Sunday? Well, we can start start with the, you know, the head of the snake, essentially, Tom Brady. I mean, he had a very comparable season to uh, Jared Goff, 375 of 570 for 65.6 or 65.8%. Um, not bad. Not the not a good Tom Brady year. That's like an average Tom Brady year, and that's what it, for me when I look at. I don't look at touchdown to interception because, quite honestly, though in the NFL you're gonna throw picks, you're gonna throw a lot of touchdowns. It's just the way that this game is is made. Now Brady's throwing like 20 interceptions, then I'm worried. But you know, very comparable, 29 touchdowns. Brady turns into Eli. You have a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when I'm ready. To, that's when when Brady starts throwing 15 plus. That's when I'm like, yep, time to go. Um, but to put this in perspective, Tom Brady threw 11 picks this year. The last two seasons, he only threw 10. 
just to put that in perspective. Um, and that's that's the crazy part about how how just crazy good this dude is. He doesn't turn the football over. And I think like this, you said this, earlier, this type of season would get a you know a, a lesser quarterback paid. <laughs> yeah, up. this will get a lesser quarterback paid. Um, shout out to Kirk Cousins. Took care, took a, yeah, <laughs> shout out to Kirk Cousins. I'm, he, he's living his best life for real. I mean, mm-hmm. I didn't have to make the playoffs. So I don't have to take no more hits, but I'm still getting this guaranteed money. Good job, dude. Um, but offensive line took care of Tom Brady. He only got sacked 21 times this season. That's less. That's roughly what about less than one time a game. So yeah. So you're not even like almost a half a time a game. So you know that's not that's pretty good. Pretty pretty good. So what, when I look at the running game, I look at guys like James. You have multiple pieces. Most teams have one really good back, maybe two complementary backs. Like you, if you think of Chicago, you have Jordan Howard, Tariq Cohen. You know you have Miami. You had. At the time, they had um, Kenyon Drake, Jay Ajayi a couple years ago. Uh, even looking at your team, you had you had Jay Ajayi, you had Darren Sproles. You guys are a little bit more like like this Patriots team where you have multiple backs, Smallwood, Corey Clemens. You have guys that can do different things. Uh, this Patriots team, they have they literally have a running back, and then you have a receiving back. It's just the way it is. Sony Michelle was drafted in the first round. Uh, a lot of Patriots fans, including myself, was like, hmm, you couldn't wait until the second round and go snatch him? Now – Keep it That's the thing. The Rams have a Todd Gurley. The Eagles and the Patriots yeah. have, like, three guys that make a Todd Gurley. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, we gotta right. we got to together right. a Todd Gurley. But it works for them, so whatever. It works. It works. It works. <laughs> so you have, you have a Sony Michelle who had 931 yards, and that's only playing in roughly, what, 10 games? Because at the beginning of the season he was hurt, so and he was hurt throughout the year, and he still had almost thousand yards. That's scary in itself. Uh, he he gave you six touchdowns also on the ground. Uh, you had James White, who, for all intents and purposes, has all he has a super, he has a invisible Super Bowl MVP. Tom Brady can they can give it to Tom Brady, but we know who won that. So we we know who that MVP belongs to. Uh, but he's in. He he didn't he ran pretty well almost 500 yards 500 or, or five touchdowns on the ground but his impact is in, through the air uh, for me when I look at him he's the true X factor because he led the team uh, in re- he's one of the top leaders on the team in receiving yardage over 700 almost 800 yards of receiving yardage seven touchdowns that's a good receiving right. year for a number two receiver in this league uh, 87 right. catches I mean that's a that's a pretty darn good year. So he's the guy that he really can – you can call him one of the guys that stirs the drink because he's a matchup nightmare. You split him out. One of the things I always see with him is Brady will split him out. If you're in there in four wide, five, and they want to make him the fifth man, they'll split him out wide outside the numbers, and Brady will get a good look at the defense because the defense has to shift. Now, I, I want to preface that by saying Wade Phillips is not bothered by this because – Looking back at those Bronco teams, which, which was the last time we ever got to see Wade Phillips against these Patriots, um, splitting James White out, he'll, you, it'll show you zone. It'll instantly show you zone, but then you bring James White back to his running back position, and it's always been man. It's been man the whole the whole play, but they'll key to leave will back off a little bit just to give respect. But they're disguising coverage as well. Typically, most teams aren't able to do that because they just don't have the personnel. But that's what James White does. It's the game inside the game because you ha- he, you have to treat him like a receiver. If you look at how the playoffs played out and down the stretch of the regular season when Sony Michelle was in the game, Patriots are running the ball 99% of the time. If James White is in the game, you, you're, we're throwing the football 99% of the time. But then you throw in Rex Burkhead, who's a, bit of, a little bit of both of those guys, and that's where the matchups start happening because he, you can split him out wide and use him as a decoy. You can bring, keep him in, keep him in the backfield, run the football with him. He's a utility guy. So many weapons back there in the backfield, and we haven't even got to the receiving core. You have Julian Edelman, who, I mean, 
I'm just throwing this out there because this has been thrown out there a little bit. Um, and I don't think the, the two guys, when you throw these two guys' names out, it, it, it seems like a slam dunk instantly. But is Julian Edelman a Hall of Famer? And if he, if he is, does he get in before Calvin Johnson? Wow. <laughs> That's a question that I'm not touching right this second. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to touch that. I'm not really ready to But it's touch something it. to ponder but because. I, exactly. You no, know, because if it does happen, it's not going to happen off the back of him being the prototypical type of receiver that gets into the Hall of Fame. But he could be the best of that certain niche that, He's niche a, that may have right. been. That, created that by receiver. you know another former Wes Patriot receiver, Wes Welker. <laughs> yeah, Wes Welker. So you know, <laughs> and and the reason I and, and part of my, I'm not making an argument for either one, but if you ever notice, who does Tom Brady go to in the clutch moments? Right. Who does he go no to? Who do the no Patriots question. design plays around? I mean, you. I mean, mo- just moments. Uh, Baltimore years ago, double pass. Falcons a couple of years ago, uh, the catch that that's like the catch part two. I mean that catch, that was the Super Bowl for. I mean if you remember no other play, that's the one play you remember. Ball goes in the air somehow. He miraculously catches it. Seattle, he's turning guys around because they have big big long corners and they can't keep up with them. So he's he's the guy that Brady goes to. He's not just a slot receiver. He does a little bit of everything. And by the way, he's coming off a knee injury, by the way, too. So uh, you have you have Chris Hogan. He's more of your number two. He can he can stretch your field a little. He's not really a burner. Uh, you got Gronk, who's a, even though he's a shell of himself, I, I I encourage anybody that says Gronk is a shell of himself, go watch the Chiefs game. Go watch the Chargers game. The way this team is running the football, he's a big part of it. He's probably still the best blocking tight end in the league. It's like having an extra offensive lineman. And I think Gronk enjoys blocking people more than he does running routes because his, he's such a nasty blocker. It's almost like he has a guard's mentality where he just wants to just drive you into the ground and push or push you back 10, 12 yards. And I think he enjoys messing with those corners, those little guys, you know, the, the Robies of the world. Yeah, I'm calling Roby out. Yeah. Um, I, I want to see Gronk just drive him about 10 yards down the field and see how much he thinks of, you know, those old guys. But – you know, the, the offensive line, one of the best in the league. Uh, you know, you look at Shaq Mason, uh, Georgia Tech, the only Georgia Tech offensive lineman in the league. Go figure. Um, Joe Tooney uh, at left guard. He'll be the – if the Patriots win this Super Bowl, he'll be the first player in NFL history to win – to be in the Super Bowl. Actually, I'm sorry. The stat is he's the first player uh, to win – to be in the Super Bowl three years in a row. Um, as a in his first three years, that's crazy enough in itself to be for that to happen. Uh, David Andrews, really good center. Trent Brown, the giant of the group, was like six eight, like three hundred and sixty pounds. He but he moves like a he's very nimble. And then you got Marcus Cannon on the other side. He's your run guy. He you're, you're running. That's who Sony Michelle's running behind. I mean, the offense is a, is a is a beast of a group, but they get it done in different ways. They're not the conventional team that just says, we're just going to line up in shotgun and, or we're going to line up in, in I formation and we're just going to run it down your throat. They do it in different ways. And I think we, Tom Brady's the operator of all, with him being the operator of all of this, he plays mind games with, with the defense and the defensive coordinators. And, you know, defensively, mm, set, the defensive line needs a little, little room to grow. Uh, Trey Flowers is the guy, is the pass rusher. Dante Hightower is your is your enforcer. Kyle Van Noy is kind of your speedy linebacker. Uh, Patrick Chung is kind of your utility player. He can play safety. He can he's your extra linebacker, that hybrid guy. Devin McCourty is your 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 deep safety. Stephon Gilmore might be the best corner in football. Uh, he actually was graded by uh, PFF. He was actually graded as the number one corner in the in the league. Uh, this secondary is pretty good. Jason McCourty can be a liability at times, but uh, J.C. Jackson, really good player. He's going to be your, uh, like, bottom OC last year. Malcolm Butler a couple years ago. He's that guy that the Patriots always just kind of just bring up. They develop him. Somebody's going to get let go, and he'll be the next guy up. Um, 
Albert McClellan actually he was he's made a couple big plays. I actually went to high school with Al, Albert McClellan. He was a, a senior when I was a freshman. I'm telling my age a little bit. I'm a little bit on the young side guy, but um, <laughs> uh, he he's been critical as far as depth is concerned. He's made a couple big plays as far as scoops and scores and just making some, just doing the dirty work. You know those unseen things that stats don't tell you about. Uh, but this defense is, is – they're a legit bunch. They don't give up yards I – mean, sorry, I'm sorry, they give up yards, not points. So when you look at the numbers, it looks kind of skewed. Like they're one of the worst teams in the league amongst giving up uh, giving up yards, but they're top eight in the league in points given up. They're only giving up about 20 points a game, which seems just crazy nowadays that that's a top eight thing. But, you know, it's the NFL we live in. And if you go down to your kicker, one of the most accurate kickers in the league, uh, Steven Gostowski, he rarely misses. When he misses, he annoys me because it's on extra points. He doesn't miss the ones that matter. So this roster, is, it's not a great roster. I'd give it like a B-minus, B-plus roster maybe. Solid B roster. I won't give it a B-plus. Solid B roster. They, this, any other team that didn't have a Tom Brady on it would have a lot of problems with them. If you, sw- if you said put Nick Foles on this team, this team right. would have some problems. This team would have some problems. I would. You pretty much, as as you should, you're definitely a Patriots expert. You're pretty much taking care of their offense, defense, special team. Um, we've already talked about the Rams' offense a little bit. Let's talk about the other units on uh, that Rams team. Um, like like I was talking about earlier, in special teams. I mean, not special teams. I'm sorry. In free agency, you know, they made a lot of splashes um, this past summer. Um, not too many on the offensive side, but on the defensive side is where you saw some of the names that popped off of the paper. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, Aaron Donald, probably the best player, arguably the best defensive player in the NFL. He is the best defensive Um, player. There's there's no argument. uh, (laughs) Next to him and Dominican Sue, who may be at one point, you know, maybe have held that title uh, himself. Um, and then, you know, you got the guys on in the secondary, uh, Peters, um, uh, Tlaib. They just had the names. The names just popped out at you. I don't think, even up to this point, I don't think this defense has played up to its potential. This would be a great Agreed. time to do so. Um, I think they played pretty well last week against the Saints. But this would be a great time to be – as dominant as your defensive roster looks on paper, because if not, you're going to have some problems going up against, you know, the legend over there in Tom Brady and, and the weapons that he has to work with. Um, yeah, there were a lot of, I guess, on the level of the, the Chiefs and what their defense did and let people do this season – but, you know, there were a lot of shootouts in the, in the NFL se- this season, and the Rams were a part of several of them. When you thought from the beginning, okay, this defense could be a, the type to hold people to 20 or less and just let the offense do their thing, and they should get some easy wins going into the season. Even on their 10-game win sh- – sorry, their eight-game win streak to start the season, there were a lot of blowouts there. You know what I'm saying? You had a, a – 35-23 game to the Chargers, that was a pretty good margin. So they came out of the gate looking pretty well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, they, they beat the Rams by a touchdown. They beat the Seahawks by two points. They beat the Broncos by three points. Uh, defense played pretty well in that one. It's just that the Broncos' defense played great as well. Um, so, yeah, two points versus the Packers. Gave up 45 to the Saints. Um, another close one with the Seahawks, giving up 31 points. They gave up 51 points to the Chiefs. So this is a, you're looking at this defense like, wow. <laughs> I'm not The teams that had quarterbacks that you have to worry about, you know, the Rodgers, Wilson, made uh, them worry. even Drew Brees, Mahomes, they did what they were supposed to do. They're supposed to rip you apart. I mean right. – but the teams they they that they weren't support that didn't have quarterbacks, they still kind of ripped them apart and put put numbers on the board and 
that's the scary thing about this defense that I was I'm, – I'm sitting back throughout the year and I'm like, why is, you know, why is Nick Mullins – I mean, I'm not, not – I'm sorry, not Nick Mullins. Why is Trubisky, you know, why is he keeping this team in the game? Why is Matt hey. Stafford keeping this team hanging around a little? Nick Mullins put up 32. <laughs> he put up 32. All right, so, so yeah, this, this is – that's the interesting part to me because, you know, we, we always look at teams and what they do in the offseason, and it's, it's – from for what happened to them this season, it's the reason that we say when people get these big pickups, it's the reason that we have to reiterate that's why they play the games. The games are not played – on paper. So I think it was a little bit more difficult um, sledding for the Rams as, you know, than they thought it was going to be this year. But when you have a guy like Aaron Donald, <laughs> there's always a chance for a big play, a game changing play. Um, and, and that's what he does for a team. So I think, you know, any game that's pretty much close, I think they'll all, always have a shot, even if the defense is living up to the billing. Um, you got a guy like that in the middle of it, you're always going to have a shot to do something big to in order to change a game. You know, whether that's early, middle, or late in the game, Aaron Donald is going to make a play, even though all the attention from the opposing offense goes to him on most weekends. Does it concern you that with this defense, especially in the front seven, that they give up – They, I mean, they give, run, they give up the running game in – in bunches. I mean, it's. I mean, they're one of the worst teams in the league when it comes to stopping the run. Does that concern you, especially with a team like the Patriots, who have kind of morphed into this power run team? God, it, it would concern me if I was them. Um, if I were them, and it's crazy, you know, with the guys that you have up front that are having issues um, against the run in the first place. But the Patriots are going to slam your weaknesses. They're going to try to take something away from you on the offensive side of the ball. And then against your defense, they're going to try to slam your weaknesses. That's why the Patriots are a chameleon. That's why this team looks different every week. That's why they win at the clip that they win, because you can't really watch film of the New England Patriots and say, okay, I'm comfortable going into this game because we know they're going to do this, they're going to do this, and they're going to do that. Patriots don't do the same thing every game. The, the Patriots damn near have somebody have a career game offensively one week and then one carry or three touches all together the next week. Bill Belichick. Why are you going to say that Jonah is great, man? He only, it only oh, happened one time. Man. Man. That's the one that say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, they, they're not really vulnerable to film study because – they have no problem switching up their whole M.O. if they even do anything long enough to have an, an M.O. And I think that's amazing, man. It really is. Like, the Cowboys kind of showed us what to do against the New Orleans Saints if you had the personnel to do it. And the teams that had the personnel to do it tried to mirror it, tried you to mimic a, you it. You threw a and, really big monkey wrench into that. You got to have the personnel to do Oh yeah. Oh, do yeah. what you do. I mean, yeah. that, that's you a tough do. thing to do. <laughs> right. That's what I'm talking about, but that's why I'm so – I'm always impressed with the Patriots because you're thinking – like you look at the roster and you just don't see this personnel that you think can adapt to any style of play, but they do it, and they do it well, and it throws teams off. And, you know, you can study something for two weeks, and then they'll come out – and be a totally different team. Like, we're talking Tom Brady, Tom Brady, Tom Brady. They'll come out and run the ball on you, and it won't even be Sony Michelle. It'll be freaking Burkhead or somebody getting chunk yardage yeah. on you. I mean, like, where the hell did that come from? <laughs> Doing my bit, of, my bit of study, because when I approach a game like this, because I want to look at it from all angles, um, I always go back and I say, after the bigger games, I say, let me take a minute to decompress, and then I want to go back and watch the film. And when I watch the film, the one thing I always say, you can't – the the Steelers take the, the wrong approach. You can't just sit back in zone. The Chargers took the wrong approach. 
you can't sit back in man in man and go with smaller personnel putting seven DBs on the field. They'll run the ball down your throat. You can't you can't completely attack because if you blitz blitz blitz, you know yeah you'll affect Tom Brady at some point. But guess what? He's gonna adjust, and when he adjusts, they're just gonna pick you apart down the field. They'll just hit you with short route, short route, short route, hitch, hitch, hitch you know, out routes all day. They'll hit you with little stuff, and they'll just dink and dunk their way down the field. You almost have to – you have to play – you have to adjust as they adjust. So if they're starting to dink and dunk their way down the field on you, you have to bring that coverage up a little. You have to disguise your coverage and show Brady things that he – you show him something you that you want him to see. And not and like you said, some, you don't have the personnel to do this with every team. But show him something that you he knows is going to be there, and then take it away in the moment of a play. People don't the moving pieces, how guys move throughout the play, the pre snap is going to be huge. And I think Wade Phillips did it best uh, with hit with uh, in his days with the Broncos. Can't stand those Bronco teams; they were good. Um, but they did so many things by disguising coverages, and it started up front. So if you're going to beat that team, that's how you do it. That's how you slay that dragon. All right. All right, so before we move on to, like, the keys of the game and, and give our picks and all that stuff, uh, any advantages you see from the Rams on their special teams unit? Greg Zerline, we see he can he can just he can boot it. I'm, I'm just gonna put it out there. Um, that last kick yeah. he made um, last week would have been good from seventy. <laughs> yeah, it was good from seventy, and he's always been that kind of guy. He wasn't as accurate a few years back when he first got into the league, but he's he's pretty good when it comes to that that part of the game. Um, kick return, punt return. I don't think it's gonna be that huge of a thing. Typically, the Patriots don't really. When it comes to kickoffs, they're going to kick it just short of the line of the of the goal lines. So they're going to make you make a choice. Either you're going to stay in or you're going to come out. But if you come out, you're going to have a a bunch of guys already in your face. So that's not going to be a thing. And I, they don't really present a lot of problems. They don't really outkick their coverage much. So I don't think that'll be a problem. And it's indoors. Roof's going to be. I don't. I don't expect the roof to be open. So I don't, you don't, I don't think you'll see a lot of, you know, punts sailing over guys' heads. So um, I don't think that'll be. A, but if it comes down to it, uh, if if it comes down to a Vinatieri type of situation, Jerry Goff drives him down. Uh, it could be. I mean, I don't see Greg Zerline missing. I really don't. Okay. All right. So let's get to it. What does each of these teams have to do to win this game and walk off the field with the confetti flowing as Super Bowl 53 champions. The Rams, and I, I actually was, uh, I was talking to an NFL scout about this one. Um, with on defense, it's not offensively. I, I'm not worried about that group. Todd Gurley, Todd Gurley is even remotely healthy and I'm not sure if he is. I'm not a doctor, but I think that group will be fine. It's the matchups on defense because unlike any other team where, you know, you have you have your ex receiver, your big tall guy who can it could be whoever whoever you want to name, Julio, uh, Mike Evans, whoever you want to name, you have that big one, you have that big number one receiver, and then you have that other guy on the other side, whoever that is. The Patriots aren't really that team and guys move around so much. So if I'm and this is just if I was Wade Phillips, I probably would say I want a key to lead to follow Gronk. And I know you're saying, why would he follow Gronk? Well, Mark Barrett's too small. He's, he's an undersized linebacker. He's really a safety, but he's an undersized linebacker. So he's, you can't put him on Gronk. He'll just get ran over. LaMarcus Joyner's too small. He's, he's an undersized safety. He's a more of a, a Tyron Matthew type. He's too small. So you can't put – and you can't double him because now you're going to leave uh, John Johnson the third over the top, and he's not that kind of guy. So I'm putting Akeem to leave on Gronk all night long, and I say, you got – Akeem, you're on your own. Um, if I, As far as Julian Edelman's concerned, that's where you take your 
Mark Barron and Lamarcus Joyner, and you bracket him with those two guys. Um, Rob, either that or you give put Rob. You use one of those two guys in combination with him uh, with Roby Coleman to bracket those guys. Use Peters on Hogan or Dorsett or whoever they put on the other side, and say you're on your own. You're essentially on your own, even though it's in zone, they're going to be running a lot of zone. Uh, you're on your own. So that leaves Corey Littleton, the other middle backer, and that leaves John Johnson over the, to be in the middle of the field. Those guys will be spot dropping throughout the throughout the uh, the plays to just take away everything in the middle. So for me, when I look at how that that defense is going to work. There's going to be a lot of moving pieces, and those guys will be fine. Uh, you have to, you have to lock that down and hope Sue wakes up because he hasn't really been an effective uh, pass rusher. Been able to stop the run. He's been taking on those those double teams, and that what that's not really what he does. But he can he can if he has to. Michael Brockers has to show up uh, and get some kind of a rush because we know when Tom Brady is knocked off off platform and he gets a little bit on the he gets a little jumpy he his clock speeds up and he starts having to make some inaccurate throws if you can do that that's how you beat this Patriots team and you have to hope and pray that the running game doesn't really set up the deep passing game or the 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 play action game over the middle to grow and hope your guys can hold up that's really the for me that's your key to victory because Offensively, right. if the offense can give you 20, 20-ish, 20 21, 24, and, and those guys can just do their job on the back end, they'll be fine. That's how it is. Defensively, for the Rams and for anybody, it's always the most obvious thing, especially in today's NFL, you know, to get pressure. If you get pressure, you're giving yourself um, a better chance to win. Um, blank. And I can't have a bigger period, you know, there. You look to the Super Bowl last season, and the Eagles didn't get the kind of pressure that they were used to getting um, throughout the season, which is why the game in turn became a shootout. But it took a big play from pressuring your quarterback to even, you know, turn the tide and kind of lock the game down when the Eagles may have thought that it was to slip away from them. So the Rams, on the other hand, of course, when you're playing against a 40-plus-year-old quarterback, of course you need to get pressure. Yeah, do you pay attention to those numbers, Tom Brady, against the Blitz this season? Uh, you pay attention to them a little bit, and but I don't think you totally expose yourself and just throw all of those cards on the table because what we don't talk about when we see those numbers is something that you spoke about a little bit earlier, Fred, is when he adjusts. Like, those numbers didn't tell you which one of those, you know, which, which one of the successful parts of the completion percentage were adjustments. So you might get to them, and you might make the blitz look bad. You know, the blitz might make them look bad early, but once he, once he adjusts to it, um, then it's a whole different story. And considering they left with another winning record and they are in the Super Bowl, it's obvious to see that they made adjustments, that Tom Brady made adjustments. So you don't want to totally expose yourself and do too much of that because you still are going against one of the smarter quarterbacks, one of the greatest quarterbacks that we've ever seen. Um, so it is going to come down to how much pressure you can get with those names up front. <laughs> Donald, Sue, like those guys have to press, they have to push the pocket and, and get limited time so the guy in the back can do what they do and and get to the ball to knock balls and maybe cause a couple of turnovers. Um, on the offensive side of the ball, the Rams, I think... Before we go there, be, can I ask one uh-huh. question? Can I ask one question? Mm-hmm. Um, a key to... I mean, I'm not key to, to Leo. I'm sorry. Marcus Peters, do you trust him? Because you know a guy like Brady is going to... You know what we know about, a, a, uh, about Marcus Peters, how he... He's just so eager to jump routes. Do you do I trust take him, him a little bit? Do you play the game with him, or do you just just say I don't want to play that game? I want to. I don't want to test that guy because you know he's a he's a walking pick six, and we've seen Brady throw pick sixes in right. Super Bowls already. Um, as a as a as a Rams coach, no, I do not fully trust him. 
as Tom Brady and uh, the Patriots offensive staff, I absolutely play that game. Like I said, you you know, he could he's the type that could, you know, make that game come back to bite you. But I'm, I'm frankly, you know, that's the side that I'm going to. I'm, I know that he's a gambler. I know that you can, you know, frustrate him, get him out of character, and, and he do stuff outside of the game that will get him and his team in trouble. Um, I absolutely play that game. Um, how much, I don't exactly know. I mean, it's not like the the type of thing where, okay, every time we pass, we are going over Marcus Peters' side. Like, he's no bum. So we're not just going to we, – we're just not going to treat him like his name is, you know, Joe Bill. But you have to test him. You have to test him on some double moves. You have to, you know, you have to get him on things like pump fake things that you know he has a tendency to gamble on. Um, you have to test him to try to get some big plays out there. And the best way to test him is most likely when he's, when he's up against somebody that nobody's expecting to do much. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, Cordero Patterson, Philip Dorsett yeah. types, yeah. Yeah, those those type of guys. Like, you're not thinking that they're gonna do much. Those are the guys that you might want to send out there, and 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 test them on. On the other, on the flip side, for the Rams offensively, um, they're multifaceted offense. So I'm curious to see what Belichick is going to put the most effort into taking away. But I, you know. They absolutely have to establish the run uh, with Todd Gurley. Um, of course, you mix in a little bit of C.J. Anderson, but, you know, this is the Super Bowl. I don't want to see C.J. Anderson in there getting pounded and, and Todd Gurley standing on the sideline. I, I just don't see it working for another game. No shot to C.J. Anderson because he's been running well throughout the whole playoffs, but this is why you have a Todd Gurley. You know what I'm saying? He's the best player on your team. Let him rock if he's healthy, like you mentioned earlier. So they, they must absolutely establish the run to give golf, you know, some looks down the field because we know a Belichick defense, whether they're ranked high or not, um, once this game comes around, they, they're coming after you. <laughs> Slow them down. Ty Gurley has to be that guy. And um, Garrett can work from there. I don't think it'll work the other way around. Like if they came trying to set up a run with the pass, I don't think that's going to work for them. That, that works a lot in today's NFL. I don't I see that working. Um, so, uh, offensively, I, I like it. Uh, as far as what the Rams will need to do, um, Brandon Cooks is going to be to, is going to have to be a huge, huge piece of this offense. He's got to be the guy to stretch the field because they don't really have another field stretcher. Um, and when I look at comparable guys that they faced this year, Stephon Diggs, um, even a Tyree Kill, I would say the Patriots will treat him like they did Tyree Kill. Uh, because you just don't want anybody beating him over the top. So I think you're going to see a ton of Devin McCourty over the top, or you'll see a lot of Patrick Chung on him underneath, corner over top, uh, and just saying, look, we're not letting you beat us. You're not beating us no matter what. Somebody else, like a uh, a Reynolds, a Woods, even uh, some of your other receivers, Gurley, somebody else will have to beat us. Brandon Cooks isn't going to beat us. And hopefully Brandon Cooks doesn't get knocked out like he did last year because for a while, you know, he was on a milk carton. I mean, if that happens again, uh-oh, because we saw what happens when team, when you don't have that field stretcher, you know, you know, and then at that point, too, your depth is gone. So don't want any injuries. Don't want him just getting completely knocked out. But if you really don't have a field stretcher, I worry about this offense because I wonder can they sustain that long seven, eight play drive that spans 70, 80 yards, and they do that. Yep. So that, and, and that's the, the thing for me, keys for the Patriots and, and their defense. I, I think, you know, they need to 
pack it in and, and stop Curly. I, if I'm them, I would rather, even though I've given all the props, I think he's turned the corner. I think he's proven why he's the number one pick. I think at this point in his career, Jared Goff, in a big moment like this, I think you do everything you do, you can do as the Patriots defense to put it in his hand, force him to have to beat you. So that means taking away Gurley, taking away C.J. Anderson, put it in Goff's hands, and see if he can shoot out with Tom Brady. Because I just have that feeling like no matter, you know, even if it's not a ton of points, as far as moving the ball, changing field position, you know, Tom Brady is always going to show up for that. He's always going to show up for that. So now it's Jared Goff's turn, or at least they should make it his turn, to see if he can get into maybe a late game shootout with Tom Brady and outlast him. Many have tried. (laughs) Many have failed. So, you know, that's my number one thing from the Patriots. Try everything you can do to take the the running game and the short passing out of the backfield, out of the equation, and make Jared Goff be the number one pick. Um, All right, Fred, moment of truth. (laughs) Moment of truth. Winner and score. You want me to go first? You want me to go first? I want, yeah, I want you to go first on this one. All right, winner and score. Not a uh, – I, I, st- I think this is a great matchup. I love the matchup. You know what I'm saying? Even though, for me, it doesn't seem like the Super Bowl is getting a lot of hype. I think once the day actually comes, like, I think, at least in my mind, that hype will come because this is a very, very good matchup. Um, I'm going to stick with my original pick. You know, I don't like picking against the Patriots, but I'm going to stick with my original Super Bowl pick, and I'm going to go 29-25 Los Angeles Rams. Hmm. That's what I, I like. Do. It. I like it. You know? I and, like and, that, and that comes from me saying what the Patriots have to do with Todd Gurley, but me thinking maybe they're not going to be able to completely take that away, so he's help to make his team be more than one dimensional. I got them squeaking it out with, I don't know. It might end with another new England hail Mary at the last minute to try to get this, game, you know, one in the last minute down four, but I got um the Rams by four. Give me this game. Uh, the Rams opened up as a, um, as a push favorite um, I wasn't. I knew that would that would change very quickly. Um, Patriots are a two and a half point favorite to win this one. Believe it or not, these teams have only faced each other five times since the last time they faced each other in the Super Bowl, which is crazy to think. Uh, mm-hmm. New England has won every single matchup, uh, but they've been a lot. Some a few of them have been a little bit closer than you expect. A couple of them have. Most of them have been blowouts. Three out of the five have been blowouts, but. Last time they faced each other in the Super Bowl, it was 20-17. to 17, uh, Last second field goal that started this whole thing. 40-22 um, to 22 back in 2004. Uh, 23-16 back in 2008. Uh, 45-7 back in 2012. And, four, and 26-10 back in 16. Uh, so that the other – the first – Four don't really have any bearing on this because we know how much things have changed since 2002. But that last one back in 16 seems like it could be a little bit more relevant. Um, a lot of the talent is still on this team. So I'm going to take the Patriots in this one. I think it'll be a little bit closer. I'm looking at maybe 24-17 Patriots. Uh, I mm. think that run, I think the Patriots are going to approach this game like they approach the Chiefs game. They're going to have long extended drives. Their their offense is their best defense. They're going to keep. They're going to be on long extended drives. Make sure that they, you know, two one thing is you want you want that coin toss. You want to kick off early so you get the ball in the second half. Um, establish the run. If, you, if that first, we'll know a lot about this team, these two teams after the first drive because we know how you know we the, those jabs are thrown. There's a game within that game, so 
I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing how the adjustments that both of these teams do. But in the end, uh, Tom Brady and company pull it out 24-17. And we, then we start hearing this Tom Brady retire because now he has six. He's beaten the team that, you know, he beat to start it, to start this whole thing. And does Belichick go with him? I was about to say, like, either way this game – slices, there's the potential for that full circle narrative. So, you know, if the Patriots win and indeed Brady retires, even if he doesn't retire, or and if the Patriots can't get back to this level um, and, and, you know, this might be their last Super Bowl or Super Bowl appearance in this Patriots era, people are going to say, wow, they started it and ended it you know, against the, the this Rams team. On the flip side, if the Rams can, you know, get them back for that loss, you can say, you know, the Rams helped them start their dynasty and maybe ended their dynasty. Of course, that, you know, these parts of the narratives, we won't know until the future because we can say all of this to make it a great story and then the Patriots be right back in the Super Bowl next year. So the then other, none the of this will, will mean can... anything. But you know that the, the other Eagles narrative are, that you can see. So go, the Rams on the tour now. <laughs> now the other narrative that you can see is maybe if the Rams win this one, even if it's kind of like the, the Eagles game last year, is this the beginning of a run? Because this team is built to to stand the test of time. If you really think about it, because Jared Goff hasn't been, he's still on that rookie contract, so you still got two more years with him on that rookie deal, and if you really just want to throw that franchise tag out there, I mean, but, uh, we're, th- we're talking years down the line, but you really could, you could do it, you know, if you just really wanted you, to extend this thing financially. You kind of have, have two teams, at least in the NFC, that might be built for the long haul. You might see the Rams and Eagles battling for the next few years. I'm not just saying that because I'm an Eagles fan. Like I, I personally think the Saints window is a lot shorter than a lot of people may think. Um, but I think, like you said, I think the Rams and then, like I said, I think the Eagles, those are two teams that's kind of built for the long run. Of course, health being a factor because the way that, you know, Philly in their season, they kind of show you we can still be that team from last year once we get – healthy, you know, once we get over the hangover, once we get our, our health in order. So it, it's going to be interesting to watch. But we're going to see what happens Sunday first before Fred and I get deep into future narratives. So um, um it's going to be a duty, man, and we hope you guys are, are live-tweeting us and chatting with us and hitting us on Facebook everywhere. You know where to get at us, but we are going to remind you one more time. Um. Some exciting things happened during the Super Bowl. At least I'll be here for you. I can't speak for Fred. He has a rooting interest in this one, and I know how it is. You know, when, when a big game, you do, sometimes you really don't want to be bothered. Um, tell you one quick story, Fred. I threw a party last year for all Eagles fans, though. You know, you don't, you know how you, you don't need any outside mm-hmm. energy yeah, for a game like no that. Bad, no bad. I tell you this, Fred, around 2.30, 3 o'clock, I started to regret even, do, even doing that. At this point, I'm sitting here thinking, I'm telling my wife, like, I probably shouldn't have done this. I'm like, this is probably something I need to watch by myself in the dark. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was really thinking about having all of these people in my man. And I was really thinking, like, man, I might just go upstairs in my room, close the door, and watch it by myself. Let them party downstairs. <laughs> you know, I finally. You're like me. You're like me. I'm the <laughs> right, right. Place. I was, it was the excitement of the moment that, first of all, it's not going to be a super ton of people because I don't live in Philly anymore. So it's like, you know, all the Eagles people, all the people I know that are here, you know, we can party. And it's all good if you win, but that's not the atmosphere. Not even that atmosphere is one I wanted to be in if we lost the game. Because, then you know, you might have fans. They might call themselves diehard but, you know, everybody don't take things like you. So I'm sitting here like, you know, I had to let people know, like, from the beginning. Like, all right, y'all, you know, 
all of you guys aren't used to watching football with me. I don't know how big of a fan I am. Some of you do. Most of you probably do. But the man here might flow, win or lose, in this thing. So don't think I'm weird. Don't think I'm strange. <laughs> yeah. Long yeah. time I'm coming. Saying, so, yeah, right, around 2, 3 o'clock, I was regretting it. And then, you know, it turned out for the best. So it, it worked out. I'm the, I'm that but, um, way this year. I've been invited to a few Super Bowl parties, and and I have thankfully uh, declined all of them. I I'm just, I can't I can't, you're, you're I, can't. Bowl, I have a team yeah. in this. Yeah, you're, Fred. If your team is in the Super Bowl, unless you're you you got your ass planted into a a seat at that stadium, you don't watch that anywhere but on the home turf. I learned that lesson a couple years ago against the Falcons. I was in a room. I can I can honestly tell you, this whole room, nobody in this room was a Falcons fan, but they were Bucks fans, Saints fans, Carol. Let's just say it was the whole NFC South was rooting yes, for yes. one team simply because they hate the Patriots, and I I'm the only Patriots in the room. Because if I'm you at twenty to three. I'd have been swinging on <laughs> the whole time. And then, and then, and then after there, the comeback, and then after the comeback, I would have been you could such a, a big drop. asshole. It would have been swinging on me. I would have left that it was, party. It was, like, uh, be- <laughs> let's just say I had enough to drink around about twenty-eight to three. I was, I was, I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna go sit at this bar. I'm gonna enjoy a couple of drinks, and I'm gonna call it a night. And but I said yeah. there's something in the back of my mind saying in Brady I trust and Brady I trust but this is gonna might I mean it's not gonna go out the way I think it will but I didn't think that was gonna happen and you know it started changing as things had started changing I was like okay I'm not gonna not gonna do I'm not gonna have that extra drink I'm gonna sit here and watch this and at the end you could hear a pin drop you could literally hear hear a pin drop and the one thing I said was in overtime, we get the ball, it's over. And we, you know, we saw what happened. And I used the the Kevin Garnett quote, anything's possible. And that's that's the only thing I said. I I hit him with anything's possible, and I walked out. (laughs) So so I've been on both ends of it. So, yeah, it was mic drop moment. And, you know, know, that's what – so I I get what you mean. I'm watching this one at home. I, I'm sorry. It's that's the only way I can do it. I can't sit there with other people, you know, in my ear. I need to be able to watch this. Right. I see you, and I totally, totally, totally understand. All right, everybody. So this has been uh, cover two with McMillan and Purdue, and our Super Bowl Fifty Three coverage. The game is right around the corner. Uh, we're looking forward to a big one. Um, This has been a great season of NFL football, full of ups, downs, stories outside of the game, some games, shootouts, uh, some controversy, you know, just like an NFL season is supposed to be. This is what Fred and I waited, you know, the whole summer for, chomping at the bit to get our show started for another season, and we're nearing, you know, the end. Of course, this game, we're definitely going to recap it for you guys next week, and then we'll come at you guys uh, kind of periodically um, with NFL draft talk and if any big news happens, you know, we're here for you all throughout the summer. But we're glad that you guys are with us along for this ride. Super Bowl 53 is here. This has been another episode of Cover 2 with McMillan and Purdue. For my partner and Patriot fan, Fred Purdue, I'm Devin McMillan. Like we always tell you guys, don't accept mediocrity. And steadfast in the war against ignorance, and we'll see you chump on top. Peace. Going up to LaFell. Touchdown. The big screen. Center. Over the middle. Touchdown. Play action. Cutting the wide open. Sons and Bogger. War Room Sports, www.warroomsports.com. What?
Ain't no more to it. Hi, it's Jamie, Progressive's Employee of the Month, two months in a row. Leave a message at the... Hi, Jamie. It's me, Jamie. I just had a new idea for our song about the Name Your Price tool. So when it's like, tell us what you want to pay, hey, 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 and the trombone goes, blah, 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 and you say, we'll help you find coverage options to fit your budget. Then we just all do finger snaps while a choir goes, savings coming at ya, savings coming at ya. Yes? No? Maybe? Anyway, see your practice tonight. I got new lyrics for the rap break. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law.